Srimad Bhagavatam, which was described by the personality of Godhead and which contains ten characteristics, was told with satisfaction by the father, Brahma, to his son, Narada. Although the Srimad Bhagavatam was spoken in four verses, it had ten characteristics which will be explained in the next chapter. In the four verses, it is first said that the Lord existed before the creation, and thus the beginning of the Srimad Bhagavatam includes the Vedanta aphorism, Janmadhyasya Yataha. Janmadhyasya is the beginning. There are the four verses in which it is said that the Lord is the root of everything that be, beginning from the creation up to the supreme abode of the Lord, naturally explain the ten characteristics. One should not misunderstand by wrong interpretations that the Lord spoke only four verses and that therefore all the rest of the 17,994 verses are useless. The ten characteristics, as will be explained in the next chapter, require so many verses just to explain them properly. Brahmaji had also advised Narada previously that he should expand the idea he had heard from Brahmaji. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explained, instructed this to Srila Rupa Swami in a nutshell. But the disciple Rupa Goswami expanded this very elaborately and the same subject was further expanded by Jivan Goswami and even further by Sri Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur. We are just trying to follow in the footsteps of all these authorities. Srimad Bhagavatam is not like ordinary fiction or mundane literature. It is unlimited in strength. And however one may expand it according to one's own ability, Bhagavatam still cannot be finished by such expansion. Srimad Bhagavatam, being the sound representation of the Lord, is simultaneously explained in four verses, and in four billion verses, all the same inasmuch as the Lord is smaller than the atom and bigger than the unlimited sky. Such is the potency of Srimad Bhagavatam. Tasma idam bhagavatam puranam dasha lakshanam puktam bhagavata paha vitafit jaya bhutakrit. Thereupon, the supplementary Vedic literature, Srimad Bhagavatam, which was described by the personality of Godhead and which contains ten characteristics, was told with satisfaction by the father, Brahma, to his son. Narada. In this chapter of Bhagavatam are the four seed verses or essential verses of the Bhagavatam, each of which Prabhupada has commented on rather elaborately. Now it is described that the Bhagavatam has ten characteristics which are there in the four verses but are more elaborately described in the rest of the Bhagavatam. They're, they're, they're there in the four verses but may be said that some of the characteristics are there in seed form, because it is the, just like the manvantara, one of the ten characteristics is descriptions of the changes of the manu, which in, and isha anukata, the description of the pastimes of the Supreme Lord, they're all there in the seed form in the four verses of the Bible, <coughs> but are 
more elaborately described in the rest of the Bhagavatam. The ten subjects are described. Okay, this, now we're coming to the end of this chapter, and at the beginning of the next chapter, the ten subjects or characteristics of the Bhagavatam are mentioned in one verse, and then in the verses following that, a brief definition of each of the characteristics is given. Atra, herein. Sarga, creation. Then Visarga, the subsequent creation. Is there various levels of creation? Yes, everything comes forth from the body of the Supreme Lord. The, the material ingredients in unmanifest form come forth from the Supreme Lord and there are various stages of creation of which Brahma, who is referred in this verse to as Bhuta Krit, taking all the uh, ingredients, he, is, he creates, he said to be the creator, he's the engineer of the universe. So there's creation and subsequent creation. Atrasadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhisadhis
the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And in the Surya Vamsha, Ramachandra Bhagavan. So naturally within the course of <coughs> describing these great families, there is Isha Anukata, discussion of the Personality of Godhead. He's being discussed herein as the creator, maintainer, destroyer of the universe. But even more relishable is to hear of his hear of his pastimes as he comes within this world, apparently as an ordinary person. So that Ishan Anukata also goes on in description of the great personalities of the universe. They are great because of their bhakti to the Supreme Lord, by which he agrees to appear within their dynasty. So Isha Anukata is one of the subjects. Then Nirodha, winding up of the universe, and the creation, maintenance and destruction, and Mukti, how to get free from all of this. And then Ashray, the shelter of everything, which is the the ultimate subject is Ashram. Who is the who is the shelter of all these principles? That is, of course, Krishna. <laughs> so all the uh, most enlightened people in the universe, namely the Vaishnavas, they study Srimad Bhagavatam, Tatchindan, Supatam, Vicharana Paro. They hear Srimad Bhagavatam. They study very carefully, applying their God-given intelligence with the result. The they will get release from material existence and moreover, they will attain to the planet, which is the subject matter and goal of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the Krishna Loka planet. So these are the subjects of Bhagavatam, you know, the Vaishnavas they study, Chandra, the exalted people, they study the Vedas. There are four Vedas, or sometimes said three, and mostly the Vedas are studied by persons who are more enlightened fools, because everyone in this material world is foolish, that's why we're all here. But those who are more enlightened fools, they consider, why should we simply become worms in stool? <coughs> we shall go to the heavenly planets by following the path of the three Vedas. Evang Traidhanam Anuprapanari. They take shelter of the three Vedas by which they get elevated to the heavenly planets as a result of which they enjoy mm. Swarga Sukha, Vishala Swarga Sukha. Extra, I mean, by worm in stool standards, they enjoy very elevated, very great standard of happiness. But, 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 what happens to them? After enjoying Shine punye marte lokam vishanti. They again have to come back to this world. So, evam trai dharma manu prapa gata gatam kama kama lavhanti. They simply go up and come down, up and down, up and down. So, those who are more intelligent, they come to the platform of Brahma jignyasa, atato. Now you're You've had enough of going up and down, up and down, up and down. Now come here, listen. What is this? Brahma Jitnyasa. Now we should hear the actual message of the Vedas, which is generally considered to be mukti. That Brahma Gyan, or knowledge of the, the, the spiritual aspect of the Vedas, <coughs> that begins with Janmadhyasya. Yataha, the Bhagavatam, or the Vedanta Sutra, begins, Janmadhyasa Yataha. Atato Brahma Jignasa, Janmadhyasa Yataha. 
the, the absolute truth is the source of all emanations. The absolute truth, by that absolute truth, everything is maintained. And everything, again, enters into that. So, those who are more intelligent, they aspire for mukti. So, <clears throat> those who are Vedantists, they study Vedanta with the aim of attaining mukti. And that is true both of Vaishnava Vedantists and of non Vaishnava Vedantists, mostly. We find that within the Sampradaya of Sripad Ramanujacharya and the Sripad Madhvacharya. They have studied the Upanishads, the Vedanta, very carefully and elucidated that Vishnu is the supreme personality of Godhead. So, the Vedantists, they all agree that to be a worm in stool is not good, or even to follow the Vedas for elevation to the heavenly planets and subsequent opulent, enjoyable life. That is also not desirable. An intelligent person, seeing what is this material world, should desire to be free from it. So they the Vedantists, they agree, Mukti. But the Vaishnava Vedantists have pointed out that mm, Mukti, as described here in Bhagavatam, just upcoming, Mukti ahitvanyata rupam swarupena vevastiti. That Mukti means to give up this false form that we are presently incarcerated in, in this, in this material existence and to attain our real forms, which is that of the servant of Lord Vishnu, uh, particularly Ramanuja Chantamudha, that uh, Vishnu Kainkarya, to be a kinka, personal servant of the Lord, that is the most relishable position of liberation. So all these terms are described, these are very technical terms, Sarga, Visarga, Stanam, Poshanam, Uteya, they're all technical terms and these technical terms tend to be uh, defined somewhat differently by Acharyas of different Sampradayas. They're very, it's very important to understand these terms because by different definition we get a different result. This word mukti, the Mayavadi's understanding and the, the Vaishnava understanding is quite different. The, as Prabhupada says, that the Vaishnavas and the, the Mayavadis, they agree with each other philosophically. Mm -hmm. Ever heard that one before? <laughs> Up to the point of liberation. That far they agree. They agree that we're not this body, we are eternal. We are spiritual by nature. This material world is miserable. We should attain liberation. They agree. The Vaishnavas and the Mayavadis, they agree on philosophy up to this point. And even the culture is largely the same. But at this point comes a diversion so great that the Vaishnavas and the Mayavadis, who are so close in many ways, in, in the, their lifestyle and their, their, their philosophy, and in many ways, but at this point, they become the Vaishnavas consider the Mayavadis enemies, and the Mayavadis they they say, well, all is one, everything is all. So it's they don't actually consider the Vaishnavas. <coughs> Philosophically, they, they just consider the, the Vaishnavas foolish. And so they think they're just on a lower platform. And bhakti is good. It's, that's very good. You do bhakti. By doing bhakti, you gradually come to the point of gyan. This is their idea. Shankaracharya gyan is So they, they think that the Vaishnavas are just 
less intelligent fanatics. But anyway, let them be. It's good for let them be. Let them think like that. It's good for them at their present state. It's very difficult to push the mind that way because whatever you say, they they put it through the. It goes in and they say yes, yes, okay, no vaishnav. Say like that. Yes, yes, yes. You don't like it. All right, that's okay. That's good. That is all right. And anyway, later you'll understand. So, yeah, it's horrible, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, the, the Vaishnava Acharyas have very strongly pointed out how these Mayavadis, they got it all wrong. Their philosophy stinks. And it's, this is not just some fanaticism. But if, if we, first of all, if we study what the Shastra actually says, then you have to go through so much uh, exegesis, is the word. Prabhupada uses it. Once in his books, at least. There's so much study of, analytical study of Scripture. Uh, then one, uh, certain rules have to be followed, which our devotees don't know now, nowadays. Uh, our devotees in, in, in the modern world have become very intelligent in reinterpreting scripture. But uh, they, they don't know there are uh, certain rules which are accepted by all followers of the Vedic culture, by Mayavadis, by Karmakandis, by, by uh, Vaishnavas. And the rules are actually made by the Karmakandis, the Mimamsakas. Mimamsakas. Mimamsa means analysis. So all the schools of Vedic culture, they accept these rules. You can't just interpret it in your own way, as you like, without any knowledge of this. So if we're going to get into Vedic analysis, we have to be... Actually, we have to be a lot more learned than we are, which is what, probably best way best for us all just to read Prabhupada's books and accept what he says because we're really out of our depth if we try to get into all this. Uh, out of our depth, you know what that means? It, it's, a, it's an uh, analogy taken from swimming. If you go in the, if you go, if you swim in the, in the three meter depth but you can't swim properly, then you're going to drown, right? So, we're out of our depth. If you can swim in where, when the water's only one and a half meters, and you can still stand up if you can't swim properly. But then if you go in three meters or more, then you're going to drown, because you have no support. So, <clears throat> the uh, ancient great authorities, the Vaishnavas, have shown how Mayavad, it doesn't make any sense. And they may even come to Bhagavad, but mostly they like to dilate on Vedanta Sutra because the the truth of Bhagavan, which is the only truth in Vedanta Sutra, as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explained, that is actually given directly, but not directly enough for the for the dull headed, although they think they're very intelligent, Mayavadis to understand. It's presented in such a way that there's still room for them to <coughs> play around and go through all the Vedic literature and come to the conclusion that I am God, which is a complete <coughs> misunderstanding for everyone except Krishna. Krishna says, Aham, so many times, Aham sarvasya prabhavaha, latas sarvam prabhavati, latat parattar ananya, kinjidasti dananya. So if anyone else but Krishna says that, then they're completely in Maya, completely wrong. And if Krishna says it, he's completely right. So if the, the Mayavadis, they come to the conclusion, I am God, it means they, for all their Vedic analysis, very intelligent, they misunderstood everything so badly that they end back being worms in stool, or jackals, or rocks, they enter into rocks. They, 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 it's, it's like, you know this game, Snakes and Ladders? You know, we used to play that as a kid. Nowadays they play much more sophisticated video games. You know this game, you throw the dice and you go up the board, one, two, three, four, you come to... And then, but if you, if you have a ladder... You
Krishna is to be found through Srimad Bhagavatam, which is a maha a Mahapurana, but more than a Mahapurana, because this Srimad Bhagavatam is Krishna in literary form. All the Vedas are Krishna. They're non-different from Krishna. Everything is non-different from Krishna, but the Vedas, they are Krishna, and through the Vedas, Krishna is to be found, but only the subject matter of the Vedas is Krishna. But nevertheless, the Vedas are presented in a manner which is uh, can be bewildering, simultaneously bewildering and purifying, because conditioned souls are in this material world because they don't want to know Krishna. So if we just the idea the idea of Vyasadeva's idea of presenting the very literature, Vyasadeva's idea that's Krishna's idea, is that people will people who are foolish they, they don't want. If we say, my dear friends, you just come to Krishna, they will say no. You ever had experience that on Sankhya Chan? They say no. <laughs> That's it. They don't want to discuss. No. And they're already 20 meters down the street before you can say anything else. They see you coming and they, they speed up. So they, they don't want. So the what do they want? Sense gratification. So the Vedic knowledge is presented in such a way as if its goal is to present sense gratification. And this, the monks, and the, the uh, karma countries, what are they called? That, that school? The, ah, I forgot now. We all know, because Krishna, he spoke that wrong philosophy to us. Karma, ah, karma yeah, monks. So they, uh, they, they very strongly argue that the goal of the Vedas is to enjoy sense gratification. To go to heaven and enjoy. It's written, it's written in the Vedas. You should go to the heavenly planets and enjoy. <coughs> See, so we are strict followers of the Vedas. So they don't understand that this is bridge preaching, as we often hear about nowadays. It's to just to to offer some sense gratification. Maybe you don't hear about it here so much because you just do real preaching. But. The, the idea is you offer something, people something that they are interested in and gradually draw their attention toward that which they really need to be interested in, which is Krishna consciousness. So, it, like that, the, the Vedic knowledge is presented. It, it's all meant for understanding Krishna, as is stated in Bhagavad Gita. Which line is that, famous line in Bhagavad Gita? Can anyone say? All the Vedic knowledge is meant for understanding Krishna. Yes, by these Jisar Veraham Eva Vedya, that Krishna says. In all the Vedas, Ved means knowledge. The object of knowledge, that which is to be known, is Krishna. But that knowledge is not presented directly enough for the. Actually, it's all for one who. Knows what is the purpose of the Vedas, he'll see Krishna only in the Vedas. What to speak of in the Vedas? He'll see Krishna in everything. He'll see Krishna in the rain. He'll see Krishna in the sun. Tapami aham aham barshan nigrinami utsrijami cha. He'll see Krishna everywhere in everything. Yomam pashati sarvatra sarvang chamai pashati. Tazyahang na pranashyami sachame na pranashyati. One, one. Krishna describes the perfect yogi who sees me, Krishna says, in everything and everything in me. And such a yogi has never lost to me, nor am I ever lost to him. So, the Vedas, only Krishna is there. But those who are bewildered, they don't see Krishna, they see sense gratification. Oh, sense gratification. You can get more sense gratification. Look at this. You can go to the heavenly planets and enjoy with the Apsaras for a long time and you can booze off and you don't get a headache and it's great and it's wonderful and you can enjoy and let's go let's follow the Vedas but within the Vedas little indications here and there sadhus come here and there and say actually this is all useless really? how is that? 
He looks happy. He's not indulging in sense gratification. Maybe there's more. Or we see that following the path of the Vedas, we, we get many sons and many wives and big property and name and fame. We're still miserable. What's going on? Did the Vedas cheat us? And at that time, the Lord will arrange the two that Sadhu will come and give some knowledge. No, it's not the message of the Vedas. There's more to it. Vedanta. This material world is temporary and miserable. But we are spiritual. Aham Brahmasmi. I am spiritual. I am spirit. Actually, that's what it says. I am spirit. So then they become interested in spiritual life and generally get misled there too because this the the seed of desire for sense gratification. <coughs> I shall enjoy Ishvara Ham Ham Bhogi. I shall be all in all. That's also the so this thinking Aham Brahma Brahmasmi So Ham I am that I am he that uh, if that's combined with the de with the desire for spiritual life but if that's not clearly eradicated, the enjoying spirit, then one goes off on a major diversion. Mm. That in the path of Gyan, one accepts austerities to be free from the uh, spirit of enjoying this material world. But if the spirit of enjoying is still there in the heart, then there will be the desire to enjoy spiritual existence. Now I'm going to spiritual existence, I should enjoy that. So the Gyani, he appears to be becoming more advanced, but he didn't really become advanced, because the seed, the, 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 the root disease, that I shall, I shall enjoy, I shall be the center, that, that he actually becomes more fallen, because instead of desiring, I shall be the husband of ten wives, I shall be the father of a, of a hundred children. I shall be Indra. I shall be Brahma. Instead of these desires, he desires to be God. So he just expanded his desire. And although he appears to be detached from material life, which in one sense he is, rather he's just transferred his attachment to enjoying in a more expanded manner. So his austerity, which he undertakes with great difficulty, that doesn't actually help him, and he comes crashing down <clears throat> to become a jackal, or a rock, or, or a very snake, or a very envious position, because actually his, by, by design to, be, to become the supreme enjoyer, then uh, his envy of the Supreme Lord becomes more increased. So his apparent purity is not purity at all. They, they appear to be purified by undergoing very difficult austerities, but not Actually, actually purified in one sense and as much as they're not engaging in gross sense gratification and they enter the spiritual atmosphere but they don't enter the spiritual world so lacking any uh, lodging place lacking any shelter they got mukti but they didn't get ashram <coughs> so they come down down again to the material world so the Vaishnavas they uh, Identify mukti with ashram, not that, not that, uh, anadrita. They 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 fail to offer uh, respect and love at the lotus feet of Lord Vishnu. So, without that shelter, without find, they go to this spiritual atmosphere, but without getting shelter on any of the spiritual planets, they come down again. So the Vaishnava Acharyas, they have uh, analyzed that the, the, the goal for the conditioned soul is to become liberated. And that 
liberate, there are different kinds of liberation, and the yeah, the Vaishnava Acharyas in their different samadhis are done by their different mm, interpret or understanding of words. They have different uh, understandings in the Gorya Sampradaya by uh, studying Bhagavatam. They, they, they're seen there. Sarupya, Samipya, Sarshti, Salokya. These four kinds of liberation. These are suitable for Vaishnavas to uh, have a form similar to the Lord, to have opulence similar to Him, to live just by Him, to be kinka, kinka, kinkara, what shall I do? To be a personal servant. And, uh, what did they say? To have the same opulence. Did I say all four? Did I repeat? No? Uh, so, uh, there's one other, Sayuja, or Kaivalya, one other, this, this kind of liberation of the non-devotees, of the Mayavadis, that is not accepted by the Vaishnavas because there is no opportunity to serve the Lord. They, they want their mukti along with service. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has given a more complete understanding of Srimad Bhagavatam. That mukti in itself is not a goal for the jiva. The only goal is to find that ashram. And that even if one is superficially not liberated from this material world, if he has ashram, if he has shelter at the lotus feet of Govinda, Mukunda, then he is liberated. Jivan Mukta Sa Uchate, Yaha Yasya Hareya Dase, Karmana Manasadira, Nikilas Yatyabas Tasu, Jivan Mukta Sa Uchate. That one who, uh, even in this world, Iha, in this world, one who identifies himself as the servant of the Lord and offers all his words, activities, his everything, his heart, in the service of the Lord, then he is liberated even in this very life. He doesn't have to wait for a change of body or, or giving up of the body to be liberated. He's already liberated. And for such a devotee, liberation is not very important. And the Kaivalya Mukti, or the, the liberation by being absorbed in the uh, effulgence emanating from the Lord's body, Brahma Jyoti, that the followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they find to be just like hell, Kaivalyam Narakayate, because there is no opportunity to serve the Lord. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has gone, he's given more understanding than that of the previous Acharyas, He's given the full understanding that even to desire mukti, I shall attain liberation. Even that, even in that, there's a hint or a trace of some personal desire. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Mama Janmani Janmani Shwari Bhavata Bhakti Rahantri. May I have your Ahaituki Bhakti, your unmotivated devotional service, life after life, even if I don't get. Mukti, let me take shelter in your lotus feet. So the exchange of, uh, the loving exchange between the Lord and his devotees. This is the uh, subject matter which Chaitanya Mahaprabhu highlights. The Bhagavatam is a highly philosophical work. It is the, it is the, uh, expanded or, or fully, uh, what is that word, Vikasita means, like the blossomed uh, manifestation of Vedanta Sutra. You know, highly philosophical. So much, uh, just like each one of these words, Sarga, Visarga, Sthana, Poshana, each of these words requires 
hundreds of books to explain, and then even in hundreds of books, cannot be explained fully, as Prabhupada mentions here in this purport. We can have four billion verses of Bhagavatam, and that, even that not complete, and still complete in four verses. Everything is there in four verses, that can be expanded into four billion verses, and still will not, will, will not be complete. So, it sounds like a contradiction, but it isn't. Because within the four verses, the four billion, trillion, zillion verses are all there. And in the four billion verses, which are to explain the Lord in all detail, is insufficient. Because there is no uh, end to his stories. But the, within the four verses, the, <coughs> the Supreme Lord is described, and he in the language of Vedanta, Upanishads, is Raso Saha. He is Rasa. He is certain. He is Rasa. He is Rasagya, Rasavit. He is the Noah of Rasa. He is Rasishva. He is the Lord of Rasa. He is Rasa Murti. He is the, the very form of Rasa. And this Rasa, the exchange of the of uh, affection, the the wonderful uh, or the wonder which is generated from that, or the wonder that is experienced by the devotee and by the Lord in their wonderful exchanges, <coughs> that is known as rasa, and that is the subject matter of Srimad Bhagavatam, Pivata Bhagavata Rasa Maunayam. One should uh, go on drinking this Bhakti Ras, which is the subject matter of Srimad Bhagavatam, and is there in every verse of Bhagavatam and in every syllable of Bhagavatam. Those who are rasik, they are enjoined to drink the nectar, rasa of Srimad Bhagavatam. They can find it in every verse, this rasa kata, that is especially uh, vikashita, or expanded or expressed in the tenth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, which we're going to be hearing about, which is the, the smiling face of the Lord. We begin our, if we're so fortunate to have the desire to have darshan, of the form of the Lord. We begin at his lotus feet and gradually progress up to his smiling face. Those who are qualified, they can see the Lord face to face, eye to eye, and hear the sound of Krishna's flute <coughs> in the tenth canto of Bhagavata. That sound of Krishna's flute, that is that Gayatri Mantra. The sound of Krishna's flute is heard throughout the Tenth kind, especially in the Vrindavan pastimes, because in Vrindavan, the uh, Vangshi Priyasaki, the, the, the flute is the constant and very dear companion. That is, Krishna is always with his flute, at least Krishna in Vrindavan. When he goes outside Vrindavan, we don't see his flute. But in Vrindavan, he'll always be having his flute, his very dear flute, which calls the devotees, especially the gopis, who Chaitanya Mahaprabhu certified, Ramyaka Chetu Pasana Brajavad Hugar Gena Yakam Pita, that the, the, the best method of worship of Krishna is in Vrindavan, that which is conceived of by the gopis. So this is all to be explained in Bhagavatam, but not everyone can find that in Bhagavatam. Madhvacharya, he, he didn't find it. <laughs> he was very cautious. He, he's establishing uh, philosophically. Hari Sarvottama. Lord Hari is top of, he is above all. But then we find the, the gopis, they don't think like that. Yes, they think he's the topmost, but Topmost, but not in terms of Aishvarya, Sya Samagra, Sya Virya, Sya Yasya Shashriya, Jnana Vairagya, Yashchaiva, Shannang Bhaga Itingana. Not in, he is Bhagavan, but how he is Bhagavan? By his uh, opulence, 
by his power, by his fame, by his beauty, by his knowledge and his by his renunciation. He is supreme, he is unmatched, he is inimitable, incomparable. And so in this way he is Bhagavan, above all. But the gopis, they don't recognize that. They, they don't think he's the Supreme Lord, supremely powerful. In the Vrajavasis, they don't think like that. I was saying this the other day, when Krishna is holding up Govardhan, then the, the cowherd boys, they say, Krishna, you must be getting tired now. So maybe Sridham or Sudam or Dhamma, one, one of us can hold up the hill instead of you. So Krishna, he allowed them a little bit just to try. He said, okay. Hold it up with your sticks and then I'll just let go. Boop, and it started to topple and fall down. And oh, not that. So, with his Udarapani, with his liberal hand, he held up Govardhan Hill. But the, the Vajvasis, they think, no, oh, Krishna's just one of us. But Madhvacharya, he, he has little entrance into this, at least what he has presented. He also knows Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. What he has presented was suitable for the people of the world at that time that they need to understand Hari Sarvotama. He is supreme because if we start to hear how the gopis are chastising him and the cowherd boys are jumping on his back, then how are we going to understand that he's supreme? That that concept will be spoiled. So, Madhvacharya has not broadcast this. But Chaitanya Mahabharata has broadcast that Hari Sarvotama, how, he is, how is he Sarvotama? Yes, in his opulence, in his strength, in all these ways, he is the best. But especially because... And why Chaitanya Mahabharata, how he has discovered Krishna, Krishna's two Bhagavan Swayam, as the actual subject matter of Bhagavata. Why not Vishnu, Narayana, Ram, Nishinga, Varaha, Vamana, Parashur? Why not? There are so many forms of the Lord. Why not them? Because Krishna is Rasarasi. Because, because of his mm, special qualities, which even Lord Narayan doesn't have, which makes him sweeter than sweet. Undoubtedly, Lord Narayan is very sweet, and the devotees, they enjoy very much to see him, to be with him, to serve him, to have loving exchanges with him. But Krishna, the loving exchanges he has with his devotees, they are more sweet due to absence of uh, concept of him being the Supreme Lord. More sweet. And Krishna has the, the four special qualities. Lord Narayan doesn't have a flute. So I may say, well, that's not a very big difference. He can make any number of flutes that he likes. He's the source of everything. Anyone here play a flute? Are there any flute players here? <coughs> anyway, you can, you can drive down to Ljubljana and buy a flute, or you can even make one. So Lord Narayan, but he doesn't, it's not part of his personal paraphernalia. His personal paraphernalia is Shanka Chakra Gada Padma, or Padma Gada Chakra, Ch Shanka Chakra, in different combinations. And in different forms, he sometimes also has bows and arrows and different weapons. But we don't see him playing the flute. So the, the followers of Lord Narayan, who are so much... Uh, wrapped in the mood of considering him the Supreme Lord and considering this is supreme, they cannot appreciate that Krishna is better because he's got a flute, because they don't give much value to a flute. And what's a flute? Especially Krishna's flute. It's not even a silver flute. It's a bamboo <laughs> flute. <laughs> so, what's in a flute? Well, you have to be a gopi to understand, or a cow. The flute is used for calling the cows. So, what, you know, and again, what's so special about the cows? This <laughs> Lord Brahma, he had this doubt. Now, what is this Krishna? I, I thought he was my father, Narayana. I am the son of Lord Narayana. 
And who's this? I told this Krishna. You know, we asked him to come, and he came. He's run his four hands, and when he came in the prison house of Kamsa, then again he went to uh, Bodhi from Krishna, but he seems to have completely forgotten that he's Narayana. Or maybe he's not even Narayana at all, because he's running after some cows. <laughs> and, you know, we don't do that. We're Brahmins, that's for Vaishyas. So, don't quite get it. So, the cows, they run after Krishna's, the flute is actually for cowherd boys. And it's for calling the cows. So Krishna's transcendental flute, that is one of the special qualities which makes him even more complete than Narayan. This, this, uh, he has his flute, he has his extraordinary pastimes with his extraordinary devotees. And although Lord Narayan is certainly the most beautiful but Krishna's beauty <coughs> exceeds that of Lord Narayan, which is unlimited. Lord Narayan, his beauty is unlimited, it's not measurable, is it? But Krishna's beauty even exceeds that. So, by his pastimes, by his devotees, by his flute, by his form, Krishna, in his incomparable form, Krishna is more, although no one is more than Lord Narayan, no, Krishna is not different from Narayan. He is more than Lord Narayan. But who can understand this? Who can understand that the gopis are more exalted than Garuda, than Nanda Sunanda, the personal associates of the Lord? Who can understand this? Those who have understood Rasarovai Saha that for, Krishna, for the Supreme Lord Himself, His exchanges with His devotees are more important to Him than His opulence. As we will find in the ninth canto of Bhagavatam, spoken very significantly by the Lord as Narayana. Aham bhakta paradhi no evadvija. He tells Durvasa Muni, that I am not independent. Which, at the beginning of Bhagavatam, we have... Um, what is that first verse? Tell me, tell me the first line. Janmadhyaya Sayyata. I'm just seeing if you learned it. Janmadhyaya Sayyata. Yaton Bayad. Itarata Shartish Abhigya Swabhigna. Swabhigna. That's important. Swa Abhigna. He's, he knows everything by his own potencies. He didn't have to go to school to learn anything. Swarat. He is independent. On principle, he is independent. If we, un if we study the absolute truth and come to the ultimate understanding, we'll find on principle, he is independent. But by choice or being overwhelmed by the love of his devotees, Aham Bhakta Parad, you know, I am subordinate to my devotees. And just to make it more clear, he says the same thing in another way. Nahi Swatantra. I am not independent. So the supremely independent Supreme Lord becomes dependent upon the love of his devotees. Becomes dependent that, that he has no choice but to do as they desire. He is bound by their love. So this Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to teach, and this the followers of other Sampradayas, they will not accept because they won't find it in the Vedas. Actually it's there. All the Vedas are only meant for understanding this. But it's so secret, even the Vedas most of them, they can't understand. That was why we have the prayers of the personified Vedas, which Viswanath Chakravarti Thakur has described as, most of the Vedas are rather repentant. That we're just describing all this karma and jnana when the real object of the Vedas is Narayana. So, uh, they are describing like that, that actually we are meant, 
Our real purpose is to describe here the question of Parikshit Maharaj, which uh, gave the impetus to Shukadev Goswami to uh, speak the prayers of the personified Vedas was very important question that that the supreme absolute truth is by definition beyond the modes of material nature. So how can the supreme absolute truth be described in terms that can be understood by persons who are within the modes of material nature? In other words, how can how can we even understand the Vedas? Because the Vedas are meant to the Vedas are meant to lead us to that which is beyond the modes of material nature. That, that sound is transcendental, but we are not. So how can we understand? So the answer is that by the mercy of the Lord, this is described. This is already been described actually by Lord Brahma himself. Atapite Deva Padam Bujadvayam Prasadale Shanu Grihita Ilahi Janati Tatvam Bhagavan Mahima Achanya Eko Pichirang Chiring Vichinvan That simply by study of the Vedas one cannot understand. Even in many, many lifetimes of doing so. But if one has the mercy of the Supreme Lord, even a slight drop, then he can understand everything about the Supreme Lord's greatness. So this point is again and again repeated throughout Srimad Bhagavatam. And this point Chaitanya Mahaprabhu especially makes that it is not by our own endeavor that we can understand the Supreme Lord, but by His mercy. That by personal endeavor it is not possible to understand the Supreme Lord. It is not possible to understand him by the mundane senses. But when he becomes pleased by our endeavors to glorify him, then he reveals himself to us. And that's why it's necessary to have a guru or a go-between between the Supreme Lord and the devotee or the aspiring devotee who can uh, is the go between between the Shastra which describes the Supreme Lord and the aspiring devotee because he is the interface or the, 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 the medium by which those who are on the mundane platform can be raised to the spiritual platform by hearing the message of Bhagavatam from the person Bhagavatam and when that sound enters the ear then of the uh, aspiring devotee, then it has the result. Nashta Prayesh Baba Dreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sayyidina Bhagavati Tamashoka Bhakti Bhavati Naishti. So the, the, it, it, destro it simultaneously <coughs> destroys the inauspicious things within the heart and, is, and prepares the, the heart for accepting its own true treasure, which is Krishna Bhakti. That we are, our shelter is at the lotus feet of Krishna. Now in <coughs> Gorya Vaishnav terminology, this word ashray is very important. Um, because although the Gorya Vaishnava, the, the, the subject matter of Bhagavatam is Krishna. But what is important about Krishna? What is important? What is our link with Krishna? That is service, but that service that is uh, expanded by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu up to the very thick point where it's not. Love beyond surrender, beyond your service. Yes, I'm your servant. King Kar, what shall I do? I'm your servant. I'm ready to obey you. Ramanuja sees this as the highest perfection. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has presented 
the message of Bhagavatam, where the servants are so advanced that they say, I'm not ready to obey you. You obey me. Who can say that? A rascal or the topmost devotee? One of the two. Mother your shoulder. Krishna's crying. Let him cry. I have to. The pot's boiling over. Only for Krishna. He doesn't know. He's a young boy. I'll be back in a minute. So she displeases him. The whole purpose is to please Krishna, but she displeases him. Her bhakti is so great that she can displease Krishna. Someone else might let the pot boil over. She may not. How can the milk boil over? We have to, have to give that to Krishna. So he's just a young boy. Let him cry, I'll come back in a minute. Within that minute, he's broken all the pots. So she ties him up. She, he also did. He didn't like that. I don't want to be tied up. But eventually, he agrees because Bhakti Vatam, she ties him up by her love for him, is so great that she doesn't do what he says. She wants him to do what I If you don't do what I say, I'll tie you up. You must do what I say. So this beyond being a service to the level of acting for what he wants, even beyond what he knows, that one takes him. The, the parents, they serve the children in such a way that the children may not like it, but they know what is actually better for the child, what's for his ultimate benefit. So taking this position of parent is more pleasing to the Lord than uh, being his servant. But by simply studying the Vedas, one cannot come to this understanding. Because the Vedas lead us to the point of accepting him as supreme. But then, if we are to accept him as supreme, then he must be the supreme lover also. And then that love, that, uh, that is a more important principle than simply and simply service, that is all in all. But service becomes expanded to the point of pure love, where one doesn't even think of himself. Of course, they all think of themselves as servants, as Krishna, as Kaviraj Goswami has described. Even Radharani, the topmost one, she thinks of herself as a servant. And that's the very meaning of her name. Adaya Radhita Anunam Bhagavan Hari she who serves Bhagavan Hari, who is the supreme control, she who worships him the best, she is Radharani. But then, who will worship him the best? Who pleases him the best? So pleasing him may not always be subservience. By taking a position beyond subservience, they're acting in a way that is pleasing to him. That he doesn't always like to be looked up to. Sometimes he likes to be uh, chastised. He likes that more. The chastisement of his pure devotees, he likes more than the prayers of the Vedas. But those who are on the Vedic path, they cannot understand this. Therefore, they, they cannot understand what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is giving. Anarpite chiring chirat karunya vatirna kalo. He came to describe what is the rasa, which is beyond that, simply of uh, being the servant. And now when I say simply, I mean that's a, that's a very great achievement. That's a very high position. But even beyond that, Chaitanya, far beyond, so much beyond, that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has come to give that, but it may not be very easy to find in the Vedas. Ultimately, it's something to be experienced and entered into. So this word, ashray, in Gorya Vaishnava terminology, this, here we find ashray, that this means shelter. The shelter of everything is Krishna. But as Rupa Goswami begins his Bhakti Rasamrit Sindhu by analyzing that more then Krishna is love of Krishna because Krishna is controlled by his love. So the supreme controller of everything is controlled by love. So bhakti 
is more than Krishna. But bhakti is just a, to say God is love, very vague understanding. But love, there's, there's the bhakti rasa patra, the person who is the uh, who is the lover, or in whom that love of Krishna is existing. So this is why the Gorya Vaishnavas, they say that more than Krishna is Radharani. More, more than Krishna is his devotee. He himself says, Aham bhakta paradhino, I am dependent on my devotee. Mad bhakta puja gadika, worship of my devotee is more than worship of me. So this is practically realized by the devotees uh, who understand that because the, the, the love of the devotees is more than Krishna, not, not in any way denigrating Krishna, but rather glorifying Krishna. The Krishna is so great that love of him is even greater than him. And therefore the Vaishnavas, they are, the, the, the Gorya Vaishnavas especially, this idea was introduced by Ramanuja Acharya, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu accepted that. The Gorya Vaishnavas, they see worship of the devotee more important than worship of Krishna. Not that they stop worship of Krishna, but that worship of the devotee must go on side by side. Otherwise, Krishna will not be fully satisfied. This is why um, Srila Bhaktisya and Saraswati Thakur gave the esoteric meaning of the word Gorya. It's not mean not simply something which comes from Bengal. But the esoteric meaning of Gorya, of course, that's the we may say the etymological meaning of the word Gorya, or the, that uh, this uh, bhakti uh, given by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appears to have originated in Bengal. But the goal of the Gorias, that is, uh, they are Vishnu, Vaishnava means worshiper of Vishnu, and Karshna means worshiper of Krishna, and Gorya means worshiper of Srimati Radharani. Because they see that. The whole goal is to satisfy Krishna. And Krishna will be more satisfied if his devotees are satisfied. And his topmost devotee is Srimati Radharani, who, who is therefore in Gorya terminology known as the Ashray Vigraha of Prem. The topmost subject is Prem, love of Krishna. And the object of love, Vishay Vigraha, is Krishna. But the shelter of that love which even Krishna goes running to, is Srimati Radharani. So, this is actually the subject matter of Srimad Bhagavatam. You won't find it there very easily. The subject matter of Srimad Bhagavatam is actually the topmost subject, of which all the other subjects are subservient to, is Ashra, shelter. So the shelter of everything is Krishna, and the shelter of, of, of what Krishna is most interested in, which is love, the love of his devotees, is uh, Srimati Radharani. So the Gorya Vaishnavas, they find what the non gorias will, they cannot find and they, they won't even recognize she even exists. Or if she exists, she's subservient to Lakshmi, although she is Adi Lakshmi. She is the source of all the Lakshmi's. This is the actual subject of Bhagavatam, only, spo only spoken of in a very, uh, just like the Vedas, they only, the only one who is very expert, they can find out Krishna in the three Vedas. You don't find, you find elevation to the heavenly planets, you don't find Krishna Bhakti in the Vedas. But one who is very expert, who understands the actual purpose, they will find that there. So similarly, one who is very expert, that means one who is guided by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and especially by Jiva Goswami, who elucidated all these points. By Rupa Goswami, Jiva Goswami, Raghunath Das Goswami, uh, later Vishwanath Chakra Thakur, they have all elucidated these points and given us the Bhagavatam. There's one Sanskrit pundit I know in India who only reads the Bhagavatam. He doesn't read anything else, but he doesn't read the purple. As well, you know, they all give different ideas. So I'll just read it directly. He cannot understand Bhagavatam. Aham vedmi, shuko veti, vyasa veti, na veti va, bhaktya bhagavatam grahya. Na, hmm. Na buddhya na chatika. Lord Shiva says that. I understand Bhagavatam. Shukadev goes on. He understands it. Vyasa maybe. He understands it. Maybe, maybe not. 
but simply by intelligence or by writing commentaries, that in itself is not sufficient to understand how bhakti can be understood. So according to the degree of one's bhakti, that degree one can understand Bhagavatam. That's why Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, what he has given, that is the ultimate limit. There is no limit. But if there is any limit, and as soon as we define a limit, that will be broken. But the limit is love of Krishna. And that, as soon as we see there's any limit, then immediately it's broken. Because that's anandam buddhi vartana. That's always the ocean of transcendental bliss. Is always increasing. So Bhagavatam can actually be understood through Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Others, we can say, yes, they understand. But how much can they understand? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gives the actual meaning. Therefore, Prabhupada, at the beginning of Bhagavatam, he gave the, the, a brief sketch of the pastimes and teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu because Bhagavatam can properly be understood through the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And that's why I was saying these, these other sampradayas, they don't say, what is this Chaitanya? What is this Radharani? What is, it? what is this Rupa Goswami described? These Lalit Madhav and Dana Kelly Komadi. What is this? It's all, it's all just, they, they take it as imagination. There's all these dramas of Krishna's leelas. But they, they don't know how this, this is Bhagavatam, actually. This is the Bhagavatam, which is not described by Shukadev directly. But now the Acharyas who are in that, they, they are part of that Leela. They are describing by their transcendental vision. So Prabhupada says here in the purport that, that there are four verses which Brahma gave to Narada and told them that he should expand it. So he did that all over the universe, expanding the glories of the Lord. Through Vyasadeva, his disciple, he expanded the knowledge of the Lord by compiling Srimad Bhagavatam and by his Acharyas in disciplic succession. Chaitanya Mahabharata explained this to Rupa Goswami in a nutshell. Then Rupa Goswami elaborated on that. The Chaitanya Mahabharata didn't write books, but through his teachings, Rupa Goswami, Sanatana Goswami, Jiva Goswami, they all expanded the matter of, of the subject matter of Srimad Bhagavatam by their writings. And Prabhupada says the same subject matter was expanded even further by Sri Vishwanatha Chakravarti Thakur. And Prabhupada writes, so we are just trying to follow in the footsteps of all these authorities. So this is Bhagavatam. That the purport is also Bhagavatam. I mean, there's the verse, but the purport is also Bhagavatam because that is the person Bhagavat taking the Prabhupada studied the commentaries. And there are over 60 known commentaries on Bhagavatam, of which Prabhupada studied 13 before com com compiling his commentary. So Prabhupada took the essence of all these commentaries and gave his own realization also, just suitable for persons uh, in the present age. So uh, this is also Bhagavatam, because... The Bhagavatam is the description of the Lord and his devotees is the topmost literature but which is expanded upon uh, by the Goswamis who have uh, when we say topmost literature so it doesn't describe Radha and yes it describes every every verse describes but we can say more directly describing for those who are highly qualified <coughs> they can study the literatures of the six Goswamis. Bhagavatam, further expanded Bhagavatam. Prabhupada said that we, we can, uh, after studying all these books and preaching, then at the end of life we can go to Vrindavan. He said going to Vrindavan means taking shelter of the six Goswamis by studying their literature. So one has to become highly qualified to uh, study that. Given the Bhagavatam, for those who are actually Bhagavatams, those who are qualified to uh, study all of that, uh, Prabhupada has given us Krishna book, the smiling face of the Lord, in which he has uh, explicated or revealed that which Sukadeva Goswami 
spoke of only indirectly. He described who is Radharani and Prabhupada also told us that we should read all the... It's not only Vrindavan Leela, we have to read it and hear and understand and appreciate and serve all the different pastimes from the first canto of verse 1 all the way, all Bhagavatam is Krishna. So, uh, Prabhupada's Bhagavatam is Krishna. He has given us Krishna in every word, every purport, every verse, word for word meaning. Those of us who are very fortunate, we have the opportunity to come together on Prabhupada's order and daily discuss what is Srimad Bhagavatam. And that will be the subject matter of Chai Prabhu's seminar. How we can, this Krishna book, which Prabhupada explained, he, he gave this in the very early days of his mission in the West. Let the Western people know about Krishna. Prabhupada was so desirous that people would know Krishna that he he threw his disciples out on the street, get out there, distribute these books, everyone should know about Krishna. Through these books, through the pure devotees, they can take Krishna from the pure devotees who's giving these books and none that these are Krishna. One can understand Krishna through these books. Prabhupada was so much anxious that the world will understand. So distribute them and understand them so that we can ourselves can understand this as Prabhupada writes here, this is not an ordinary fiction or mundane literature. This is Krishna. And we can understand, we can we can study now. Gopi Pranidana Prabhu has started his school. He's just starting in October. So I was asking him about that school for for studying Sanskrit. He said it's not a school for studying Sanskrit. I'm not, I'm not teaching Sanskrit, I'm teaching Srimad Bhagavatam. As seen, as described through the Acharyas, as seen through Srila Prabhupada. <coughs> studying Sanskrit is the means to access the purports of the previous Acharyas. But Prabhupada said that by studying my books, one gets in touch with all the previous Acharyas. So that school will study Srimad Bhagavatam and bring the students to understand how all the previous Acharyas are present in Prabhupada's purports, everything he says, so that they can go among all the learned people of the world who don't understand this and explain how Bhagavatam is Krishna, Bhagavatam is Radha Krishna, the topmost subject beyond human understanding, even beyond the understanding of the Vedas, is that of Sri Sri Radha Krishna, given by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So we have to, as Prabhupada once asked some of his disciples, are you studying my books daily? He said, yes, Prabhupada, we're reading your books. And Prabhupada said, are you studying them daily? So study means to go more deeply. Who's read through the Bhagavatam more than once? So what, what's your experience? When you read through, then you think, you think, oh, now I finished. And then you think, well, I have to go, go back again and read. There's so much, I didn't remember. And what's your experience reading through the second time? It's always something new. Always something new. And then you feel every day, the second time you read, you feel, well, what did I do? I, I read it? I, didn't, I don't think I read it at all. <laughs> and then what do you find the third time? Each time, it's, it's, like, a, it's like entering into a different dimension. And each time we we uh, because Krishna is like that. Krishna is beyond. Krishna is not only beyond three dimensions; he's beyond any dimensions. He is trividya sima ulangita. This is Yamuna Acharya describes. There are three dimensions which Krishna is beyond: time, space, and what's the third one? Thought. So we cannot catch him by our thought. We we think now I understood. We didn't understand. We understand, the understanding is there by, 
by serving and loving and by studying Bhagavatam, which is Krishna. There's no end to no end to studying Bhagavatam. No end. There you go on. Hibata Bhagavatam Rasam Alayam. Go on drinking this rasa. Alayam, one meaning is until you leave this body. <laughs> or alayam can also mean up to the point of liberation. And then what do you do? Then you just join in the become part of the caste. Join the Bhagavatam. There's so much to be said. I'm probably all the time. I didn't look at my watch. But who cares? <laughs> <laughs> any watch? Uh, any question? <clears throat> ah, please. I Generally, can... devotees, they always, when they, when they put their hand like this, there you are. I love from, this thing in this Coming from Madhva Charya, maybe. Uh, was it two <laughs> questions? <laughs> I'm not in this thing in school. Sorry? I'm not on this thing from school. You should, they taught you, you yeah, must put your hand up yeah, like this. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. So I have one very simple question. I mean, Krishna is so kind. How, how can people be envious? I cannot understand this thing. It's so kind. Krishna is so kind. How can people be envious of him? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense, does it? It's nonsense. <laughs> But that it is possible is required because we have to love Krishna. Krishna is, Krishna is everything is thirsty for the love of his devotees. He's, he's complete and fully satisfied, but he's more and more greedy that more and more devotees will love him. He's never satisfied. So love him means it's a voluntary thing. We have to choose to serve him, to love him. We have the free will. Otherwise, if everyone, if every, everyone was programmed, you could have a program, a robot, to say, I love you. You can make a robot and give it to your girlfriend on her birthday, saying, I love you. But, you know, but no one ever loved a robot. It's not possible. If I fell in love with a robot, you can, maybe they'll make a, a, a robot which just looks like a, a man or a woman and talks and, and ah, sighs very sweetly and has all the characteristics of apparently a sweet young girl that one might fall in love with, but no one will ever fall in love with. It's just a robot. Person means choice. So we can choose to love Krishna or not, not love Krishna. And that we have the choice presupposes the misuse of it. So why we should do so? It doesn't make any sense. But that there is the possibility of our doing so must be there, otherwise we couldn't. Unless there's a possibility not to love Krishna, then there's no possibility of loving him. <laughs> it's a conundrum or a dilemma. It all fits in with that question about how did the jiva fall from the spiritual world? There's no end to this. <laughs> well, he didn't fall. And what do we do? And Krishna likes some in the spiritual world. He likes some better than others. And he just put us here and say, hey, you hate me. So where's the end of this discussion? The end is chant Hare Krishna and go to Krishna. Mm. There is, um, we heard that if we really want to enter the Bhagavatam, it's required to uh, learn Sanskrit. And if we really want to enter the Bhagavatam, it's required to learn Sanskrit. But on the other side, uh, we also... On the other that. side, you say we can get everything through Prabhupada. Yes, we can get everything. Certainly we can get everything through studying Prabhupada's books in English, or if it's properly translated in another language also. Um, but the, the, the Krishna is unlimited. So the, the, the Bhagavatam, being in Sanskrit, it, it's not just simply a literary formation. The, the, the syllables, the choice of words, there, there are many subtleties of Krishna's personality and character which are 
uh, embedded in the in the Sanskrit language, very subtle. So that made some of the unlimited subtleties and philosophical points would require knowledge of Sanskrit to enter into. But love of Krishna, that's another way. You that all that will come by by uh, loving Krishna through the Bhagavata Marg, in which everything will be revealed. It's required that some devotees, Prabhupada wanted some devotees to learn Sanskrit for and that's required in, in, in a certain specialized preaching. That's required. And when you when you go to one who's actually studied Sanskrit to study Bhagavatam, they they will understand how Prabhupada is perfectly presenting in lecture bhasha. Lecture means other than Sanskrit. <laughs> Hare Krishna.